Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Um, my name is Ike Aslan. I'm joined here with uh, Matias Pana uh, from Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Ciro Laine from Barcelona, Spain. Uh, we are a bunch of uh, language enthusiasts. Uh, we we come from the uh, Association of uh, Hyperpolyglots, and uh, we um, we talk about we are really passionate about languages. And um, in our in our conversations, we always talk about how great it is to learn a new language. What 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 we can do with all um, all the um, all the international languages that. Um, that uh, that we all speak at least uh, six of them, but in our conversations we we also talked about hey, uh, not every, pretty much everyone speaks um, English, French, German, Spanish, Portuguese. Uh, most of us are, are more fluent than the others, but there are also minority languages um, that uh, that tends to be overlooked at uh, when people are studying languages. So. Um, while talking about this, we said, why don't we make a, a small podcast about this and um, share our, you know, share our thoughts with, uh, with the fellow listeners around the world. So uh, just to give you some brief introduction from my end, uh, my name is Ilke Aslan. I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey, I'm currently living in Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, and I have been a member of HIPIA, which uh, you will find the link below, um, uh, for approximately six months now. So that's uh, that's it from my end. So let, let me uh, let me pass the mic to to Matias. And uh, Matias, tell us about yourself. Who are you? What are you doing? Well, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, I'm Matias Bermat from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I'm a uh, systems analyst and sports journalist, specialized in basketball stats. And uh, well, uh, I love to learn languages because I love to learn cultures. I speak somewhat 12, 13 languages, six of them fluently. And um, I'm a director of recruitment for Haitia Hyperpolyglot International Association, an NGO whose objective is to foster and to encourage mutual human understanding through the learning of languages and cultures. And uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to, to stay with you and to share this uh, beautiful moment uh, to discussing about um, the status of languages, minority languages, and also the, um, uh, the commit. The com we are talking always about the commitment to keep learning languages in order to improve human understanding. And that's why it's important to um, to, to, to raise awareness of, of the conscience of uh, to keep to, to, to give the language the minority languages uh, at least known not only in the academic sphere but also uh, to that normal people can uh, know different minority languages in order to uh, to improve human understanding. So Siri, uh, for me it's been a great honor to present you. For me, <laughs> Hi, so I'm Ciro and I'm originally from Turku, Finland, but now, now I live in Barcelona after um, after having lived in um, Iceland, the States and Sardinia. And um, I'm a translator, so that um, most people don't find it surprising that I speak many languages, but it's, um, it's something that I... Uh, started doing before understanding that I want to be a translator um, and I just did a quick count and it turns out that I've I've studied six minority languages if you don't count uh, Finland Swedish so I'm really excited about this topic as well well um, I, I realized that um... The, 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 minority, the, the situation of minority languages uh, in Finland, it's, uh, it, it's a matter of concern. For example, do you know the situation at Oland uh, Island? Uh, it's uh, an autonomous uh, region of uh, Finland who is almost mo it's monolingual in Swedish. And also um, 
the people who lives in Owen Island uh, must have, for example, a, a local status, a Hendrix growth. It's, um, it's a local ID that uh, enables you to live and to work there, but you have to, to speak Swedish and uh, you have to uh, detach from, from continental Finland at least for five years. And um, in, in, in that sense, uh, uh, the local administration in Holland uh, must be in Swedish uh, despite Holland belongs to Finland. It's, it, it, for example, in the case of Holland, it's, it's, it's very interesting because their idiosyncrasy is Swedish. Yeah. So quite a few people say that it's, it's only part of Finland because of geography, because it's closer. So. It, it's much closer to Sweden rather than Finland. Yeah, culturally, yeah. And uh, for and for example, um, the school curricula uh, in um, in Finland uh, about minority languages. What, what's your opinion about you? Uh, well, I was just thinking about it earlier today that um, we because we have to learn Swedish at school uh, because it's the uh, it's the other um, official language in Finland. And we call it Bakkorwatsi, which means um, enforced Swedish. So that tells you about um, how we see the whole situation. And um, and it's like, I think there are like 5% of the Finnish population who uh, report Swedish as their native language. And, and then the other 95% are like, why do we have to learn Swedish? Because of these 5% um, and, um, and then, so we all have to learn it for at least three years. And in the university, um, I, di I didn't go to university in Finland, so I don't know how much they have to learn Swedish, but they have to um, take this uh, public servants Swedish test. So in Finland, if you want to be a public servant, you have to be able to um, speak Swedish and, and talk to the customers in Swedish. Um, well. And I think... Um, quite a few people think that it's uh, it's unfair for those who have Sami as their first language, for example, or the other minority languages in in Finland. So it's uh, it's an interesting topic that would I think it would need another episode just by itself. Sure. So I, I got a I got a question about the about this uh, that, that you mentioned only five percent of. Um, of the Finnish population having Swedish as, as their mother tongue. I mean, I, I lived in Finland for a brief period of time as well, though I, I've been there many, many times. And one thing that, that, that I particularly found fascinating, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, is um, that I have the impression that Swedish is kept more as a link uh, for inter-Scandinavian linguistic solidarity. When, uh, you know, all Scandinavians get together, at least the principle is that everyone can talk in their own language and they would understand one another. I, for example, I, I studied Danish. I, I, did, I went to law school in, in Denmark. So when I speak Danish, I can very well communicate with the Norwegians easily, with the Swedes. Okay, it's, it's a bit more difficult. But at least we all speak our, our, our languages respectively and we understand one another, though. When you do it in Finnish, of course, Finnish is not an Indo-European language. It's not a Germanic language. You wouldn't be able to do this. So how relevant do you think Swedish is going to remain in, in, in the 21st century, given the prominence of English? Because uh, when I go to Finland these days, uh, nobody bothers to speak Swedish, especially if you come from another Scandinavian country. Like I try to speak Danish. So as soon as they hear that I speak Danish, they switch to English, which they don't seem to prefer to use Swedish as opposed to using another lingua franca. What do you say about that? Well, uh, uh, another another topic about uh, to discuss is uh, you have mentioned Siru. It's about the the, the use of uh, minority language in public administrations. Uh, you know that uh, in within the whole territory of Switzerland, you can be. Um, you can you, you can be served uh, and attended in 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 different uh, in language French German and Italian. But what about the situation of Rector Romanche at the level of public administration? Because as as French German and Italian are official in the entire Swiss territory, 
the, the situation of Reto Romance and different languages and different, uh, sorry, dialects, Sur Milan, Sur Servan, uh, Wali Servalser, etc. Although official, uh, it's not, although uh, as, as they are a minority language, they don't have uh, the same status uh, in uh, regard with French, uh, German, and uh, Italian. Why? I'll, I'll pass the mic first to Ciro, uh, <laughs> and then then, then, I'll, then I'll start babbling on the Swiss language politics. <laughs> um, yeah, I heard uh, that people who defend the so-called enforced Swedish, they say that it brings us closer to the other Nordic countries, and um, because um, it it's just easier for us to speak Swedish and like communicate in, in Scandinavian with the others than them all having to speak in English with us because they, they obviously can't understand Finnish. Um, and there are other aspects as well because we were under the Swedish realm for so many centuries that it's kind of part of our culture as well and our history. But that's not something you really think about when you're 15 and you have to learn Swedish. That's You don't think about the big picture or like the future that it will help you with other languages as well. It will it will make you more like not Scandinavia, but like a Nordic person. Um, but yeah, that's that's not something you think when you ha when you have to sit there and <laughs> and learn the vocabulary. Uh, but that's something I, I learned as an adult that it's actually a bigger part of our culture as well, whether you like it or not. So people have internalized this as well. I think that when it they is part of the Finnish identity to speak Swedish as opposed to something enforced. Yeah, but I think I think it's something you realize when you're a grown up. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> unless you, exactly. unless you really like Swedish, which I didn't. Certainly, certainly. <laughs> I mean, similar to what what Matthias mentioned, um, I find. Uh, similarities, but also big differences to to the uh, situation here in Switzerland. Um, I um, I'm not a natural born Swiss. I wasn't born in Switzerland, but um, I came here as soon as I could. So, uh, <laughs> but so, um, but but I, I've been living in this country for for almost 15 years now. So at least I, I got um, you know here here are my two cents on the topic. But first, the basics. Um, Roughly 65% of Switzerland speaks German or various dialects of the German language under the umbrella of Swiss German um, as, as their native language. Roughly 20, a little over 20% speaks French, mainly in the Western part of Switzerland as, as their native language. Around 8% speaks Italian. Uh, primarily in the canton of Ticino um, in, in southern Switzerland. And the rest is uh, various uh, dialects of uh, Retoromance language. Now, Switzerland has four federal languages, of which three of them, uh, I'm sorry, um, it has uh, three federal languages of which um, in addition to that, four of them are used as administrative languages. So that being said, if you are a Swiss citizen, you can use Romance, German, French, and Italian to communicate with the authorities. You have the right to petition to the parliament, to your local administration, and you have the right to be responded in the same language. Functionally speaking, only three languages are being used. Uh, that is Italian, French, and um, German, because all Roman speakers are, at, at the very least, either bilingual or trilingual. They either speak German or German and Italian, um, in addition to, to their uh, local languages. Uh, what makes the situation in Switzerland particularly cumbersome is roughly only 50,000 people speak um, Rotoromansch. And Rotoromansch is divided into uh, five dialects of which they're not very mutually um, comprehensible to one another, because one valley speaks one language, one dialect, and the people on the other side of the valley don't understand it. Uh, these dialects are Sur-Servish, Sud-Silvan, Sturmiran, Puter, and Valader. 
And uh, these dialects are mainly confined to the canton of uh, uh, Graubünden, to Grishun. And um, there have been efforts to standardize a language. Uh, uh, League of uh, Rotoromansh was founded in, in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, Lia Romansha, to standardize the orthography so that um, you know, the language could, could thrive. Um, unfortunately, the number of uh, Roman speakers have been declining um, since uh, since 1950s and 60s because uh, there are not many job opportunities in, in, in the canton. So people mostly move to bigger cities like Zurich, to Bern, to... to, to, uh, to, to, to yeah. Exactly. So when you don't need the language, when language ceases to be relevant in your life, um, you... The, the language starts to bleed. And uh, this is the particular challenge among the Roman speakers in, in Switzerland in, to, to keep the language alive and relevant in their lives. Because it's, it's a language of 50,000 people. Some, and um, some, Sometimes it's a matter of economy, but also sometimes it's a matter of prestige or... Precisely, precisely. Because and, and all... Uh, the next generation. Certainly. I mean, there are schools that teach uh, Romansh um, in, 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 in the canton. Uh, you can also take uh, Romansh uh, linguistics and literature at the University of Zurich over here. But it, uh, it remains as an academic subject as opposed to a language that is used uh, daily. So um, the, the biggest challenge that I see going forward um, for the preservation of this language is not because the state does not support it. The state provides subsidies to, uh, you know, for, for the language teaching, et cetera, but it no longer makes economic sense to preserve the language. And this responsibility lays mainly, uh, mainly with the native speakers of this language as opposed to language geeks who like to study uh, the language for, for the fun of it or, or just for the academic pursuit. And um, uh, and I'm sure you, you have similar situations in Argentina. How, how is the situation up there or down there? Well, uh, in Argentina, about minority languages, uh, we have uh, uh, two or three uh, cases uh, about, uh, for example, Quechua in Santiago del Estero is the southern most dialect of Quechua, uh, different than Bolivian, Peruvian, or Ecuadorian dialects. Um, in San Diego Estero, it speaks the southernmost dialect, and Corrientes about the Guarani language, uh, uh, different uh, different variety comparing to spoken Paraguay, and also Mapuche in uh, say the southern Patagonia. Uh, both, uh, sorry, those um, well, San Diego Estero province with Quechua, Corrientes province with, with Guarani, and um, several uh, Neuquén, Rio Negro, Chubut, or Santa Cruz with the uh, Mapuche. Uh, have uh, different um, different linguistic approaches uh, about uh, official and co-official languages. Uh, although uh, there are some kind of uh, recognition uh, in Ar in Argentina about um, lingu minority linguistics, and even though we have some bilingual education in regional languages at primary level, uh, we don't have that uh, that. Uh, that the same recognition at the administration level where we have to uh, address in Spanish. Uh, however, uh, a lot of efforts uh, are being made uh, in order that uh, to, uh, with uh, non-profit organizations uh, to, to preserve those, those regional languages in Argentina. However, um, it's, not, um, it's not an easy situation. Um, and, and that, that's the main reason why, why um, I want to raise awareness uh, about that. Uh, for example, uh, I have another issue to, to, take, to, to talk about, uh, to take into consideration. You, you were talking about um, the, the public administration at the federal level in Switzerland, but in Switzerland, you were talking about um, a, an, an environment of multilingualism. In, in which uh, in almost entirely the, um, the Swiss territory you can address in, in the four federal languages. But it's how, although uh, we have a lot of lang um, countries with uh, more than one language uh, at the national or regional levels, 
um, the, the point of plurilingualism versus multilingualism, um, it's a sensitive matter in other countries like Belgium, France, and Spain. Uh, the, the point, the, 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 the concept of plurilingualism versus multilingualism uh, in, in, in those countries like uh, Belgium, France, and Spain, who has unfortunately plurilingualistic uh, approaches, uh, and yeah, it's a matter of concern. For example, in Belgium, you uh, at the administration level, you have to circumscribe to the municipality you live, uh, either French or Dutch, or German, German in the German-speaking areas. Whereas you, you can uh, send your children to bilingual mm -hmm. schools or trilingual French, Dutch, English uh, schools. However, in your, in your administration, you have to circumscribe to the language uh, of your municipality. But uh, in, the, um, in the business you, you are working, you have to circumscribe to the language you are uh, working. Uh, the, the, more, more, um, the same occurs at the same time with a uh, uh, in a same much way restrictive model of plur uh, of uh, plurilingualism in France, in the southern part of France, when with the uh, Occitan, uh, even though Catalan, uh, Bresola, uh, Occitan, Calandrita, and Icastola uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in French, in, in Basque speaking French. Uh, about uh, primary level education, but also uh, within within Spain, we have, for example, that in, in Catalonia, we have an immersion model uh, when uh, 70, uh, almost almost seventy two percent of people in Catalonia speak Catalan. Not uh, not everybody uh, wants to have um, a, a bilingual education in Catalan. Uh, however, uh, and um, in Basque country within Spain, however, there, there are an, um, a hybrid model where um, although the, the families can decide in which kind of educational model, uh, which kind of educational model can uh, bring their children to school, we have, for example, that very, very few people want to send uh, yeah. their children to Icapola, the ex ex exclusively Basque speaking. Yeah. Uh, and normally they, they want to have um, um, a mixed model, or even only a Spanish uh, yeah. education, and that's that's a matter of concern. It, it, uh, I mean, John, maybe uh, Ciro can can make uh, better references to the situation in Catalonia, given that she lives there. Uh, but at least speaking um, of of my experience um, in in Switzerland, I, I, I did my PhD at a bilingual university here at the University of Freiburg, which is the only bilingual university in Switzerland. Um, the, the, uh, the language of instruction is the, um, are, are German and French. But the situation in, in Switzerland is so unique that I don't think it can be replicated anywhere else because Switzerland itself is a confederation. So each canton is really very, very independent in in uh, setting up their, their education policies, not only for education policies, for their taxation, et cetera. So, um, and Switzerland has been founded on the culture of, of compromise. So there, it's never the case that one language dominates the other uh, for political expediency, et cetera. So even though um, German is uh, the majority language over here, you, if you're a monoglot in German, um, you, you are not going to find many uh, job opportunities um, in, in, the, in, in the job market over here. So being multilingual is heavily, heavily, heavily encouraged. Um, I have, uh, may, maybe there are some out there, but I've never seen any Swiss who speaks uh, less than three languages over here. So the education system really gears you towards uh, being um, at least competent in another official language in addition to your native language. Plus uh, many study the second national language in addition to English. And also you might take a, a more exotic languages at, at school, like Russian or Chinese, um, et cetera. So it is, um, I, I think once the education system is established around the fact that you are 
that you truly become a plurilingual and multilingual person at the end of your education, uh, the students tend to value the advantages of uh, speaking uh, foreign languages a lot more. This is quite dissimilar to the situation, for instance, that you might find in, in, in the United States, which is a very, very diverse country. But at the end of the day, everyone, I know there are exceptions, but the, it, it's a melting pot. So if you're an American, you speak English and you don't find many Americans who are fluent in, in, in foreign languages as opposed to uh, the people that, that, that you might find in the other parts of the world. So, um, but uh, I don't know, Cyril, like uh, Matthias was talking about Catalonia. What, what's your experience? I know that you are studying Basque and uh, you study Catalan as well. Uh, tell us how, how are things in Catalonia? Uh, well, it's, it's quite hard to speak about the situation without going into politics, which I really try to avoid because, oh, don't we all because, do because <laughs> everyone asks my opinions and I always say that I don't actually, I've been here for seven years. I don't really want to have an opinion because I don't know enough. And um, so I try to stay neutral. Um, it's just about linguistic policy. It's not yeah. About, not, no, but it's, it's still... Not about still linguistic policy, but about linguistic yeah. policy. There's, no, there, it's um, actually quite a few people tend to be quite fanatic about that as well. That's mm -hmm. why it's really hard to speak about anything like that without going into politics. So It is emotional link. Yeah, and then I always say that um, I'm not learning Basque and Catalan because they're minority languages. I'm learning them because I'm a linguist. I want to see how it wor how the ling language works and how they have evolved and everything. So that's always my go-to answer when someone asks me about yeah. that. Um, but I actually I, I have a I, I have a question for both of you. Um, I was going to ask Ilger about the like how the education system works related to languages in Switzerland, but is it, um, it, it do they, do people uh, at school, do they have to learn another language? Is it mandatory or, yes. or, or is it just something that people choose to do? It depends on the canton. So in the canton of um, Zurich, you start with uh, English, the third grade, mandatory. And in the fifth grade, you start with the mandatory French. Okay. And then once you uh, come to the secondary school, you have the option to add an additional language. But at minimum, you have to um, you have to do two languages. Okay. Um, also, like in, in my um, in my original motherland in, in Turkey, for example, um, learning a foreign language is something very much encouraged. But um, I, I think given maybe our didactics are not really uh, formed in the right way. So not many Turks are fluent in, in, in a foreign language, or at least they, they feel competent enough to be able to uh, hold, a, hold a decent conversation. Though with the younger generation, uh, the situation has reversed because of Netflix, YouTube, well, you know, student exchanges, et cetera. But it is, it, it is mandatory to a certain degree in Turkey as well. But, okay. you know, as a result, uh, I, I would say, I would uh, hate to admit this, but uh, the situation, the result is not very satisfactory. Though in Switzerland, the advantage is that you learn the language and you, the language that, that you learn is something that you have to use in order to be able to communicate with your, with your fellow citizens. Yeah. Like if I go to, when I go to Geneva, I, I, I don't want to speak German <laughs> or I, I don't, I, I would talk to them in French and vice versa. You know, when someone from Lausanne or from, um, from Geneva comes to, um, comes to Zurich, uh, they speak German. Okay. Maybe we don't speak the same dialect that they learned in school. That that's a whole nother topic, but um, there, there is a large degree of linguistic accommodation in the expectation that you would speak one other language of, of the confederation fluently enough okay. and given that german and french are the largest languages um they uh you know the, the, these are the most studied languages and this puts uh, italian speakers both at an advantage and a disadvantage because um our our fellow ticinese from uh from the canto of ticino they speak all of them they speak italian and they speak french and german so this really puts them on uh, in an advantageous position in, in the job market as well. 
But mm-hmm. it's it's all about the education system. It is it makes it mandatory. It makes it advantageous, and it's kind of imposed upon you that you graduate with a sufficient set of linguistic skills when when you finish your uh, formal education. Yeah, I have. Uh, I I will touch a sensitive point, but it's about minority languages, and uh, it's about um, the Kurdish and Armenian language in Turkey. Uh, mm-hmm. And 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 we and and I will compare them with the situation of uh, minority languages in southern France. Uh, you know that uh, in in France you have the Education Nationale uh, that's monolingual in French or French English uh, at the um, uh, at the, 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 the mandatory education, but uh, every uh, every regional language. Uh, if you want to study a regional language in France, you have to uh, to follow um, a complete education or, I mean, uh, a, a two-term uh, two, a, a two-term daily school uh, where you have a half of the day the national education and the other half the regional education. And normally, the, the, those schools who have uh, uh, also regional or minority language education, it's private and uh, sometimes quite expensive to pay a Brezola for Catalan speaking uh, in France uh, or um, Calandreta for Occitan speaking in, uh, in France uh, to, to study those languages uh, are not state funded uh, and uh, I know uh, they are not state financial. And, um, you, you have to pay for it. It's the, the same, more or less the same situation of your in the Armenian community in Turkey, where although, although Armenian, uh, or Armenian language in Turkey is somewhat uh, restricted, you can study Armenian language if you belong to the Armenian community, but only at the, at the, at the double, double day education level, the complete journey education level, and it's mm-hmm. private and it's quite expensive uh, because the Turkish state not <laughs> state funded uh, that that the language. The same occurred with, the same with Kur- Kurdish language in that sense. Well, let, let me let me elaborate a bit further. It's it's wonderful that you you brought it brought up this topic. Um, I really appreciate that. So. Uh, language politics of Turkey is certainly a lot more complicated than what you might find in in, in um, other European countries. It's it's more unique, at least um, in, in my opinion. Um, Armenian is there are yes, well, Ar- Armenian is considered as an official minority language, in addition to Greek. Uh, these are minorities that were official recognized. Um, after the uh, declaration of the Turkish Republic. So there are schools whose primary language of education is Armenian or, uh, or Greek. Um, for that matter, Armenian um, is, uh, well, the situation, I've had many friends, um, I still have many friends who, um, who did their formal education in Armenian schools in Turkey. You can study Armenian as a language, as well as receiving religious instruction in your native language. But all the other topics are taught in Turkish. Like if you want to do social sciences at an Armenian school, you have to use the state's language, which is which is Turkish. So if you want to study mathematics uh, or, or physics, etc., it is um, the, the curriculum is geared towards keeping Armenian only as as a cultural language, so to speak, you are not you exposed can, to the entire study, curriculum. You cannot study other subjects different than language and religion and in other languages, different than the official language of Turkish. Right, like for example, if you want to, you, you will have to take history classes, for example, when you're in high school, history classes are in Turkish. Oh, of course, they might mix uh, officially there in Turkish. Of course, you know, you might switch to Armenian while, get, while lecturing, etc. Same thing with Greek, but um, the, the 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 challenge of um, maintaining the Armenian language in Turkey has more to do with the linguistic relevance of of the of the um, of the Armenian language in a sense that 
you know, the lingua franca in Turkey is Turkish. We have many um, minority languages in Turkey, Pontiaca. You have various dialects of Armenian, like Hemshin, um, or, you know, you have uh, Syrian, you have, you have Kurdish. Maybe I shouldn't call Kurdish a minority language because roughly 20 million people speak the language, so it's not such a minority language. But these are not considered as official languages by the state itself. They're not used for administrative purposes. So okay. the Armenian and Greek, for example, they're, they're, they're confined to their community for intra-communal language, that the Armenian community in Turkey speaks Armenian as their language, but that you cannot go and petition to the Turkish government for a document in Armenian, etc. cetera. That, that, that would not be the case. And about linguistic politics, uh, about the, the linguistic policy in Turkey, uh, the situation of Kurdish is it's somewhat tough in southeastern Turkey. Uh, about the you you are seeing circumscribed uh, Kurdish language, uh, mostly targeted to your family, and you, you all you almost cannot use uh, Turkey uh, Turkish. Uh, sorry, you you cannot use Kurdish uh, except your household. In, in that sense, it's. Uh, I mean, the education, the education schools in Kurdish are uh, quite few and restricted. But yep. I want to, I want to hear your opinion about it. the, uh, like you mentioned, there are no Kurdish school. At least you cannot study in Kurdish um, at, a, at a state school. There are language schools where you would be able to study Kurdish as a as a as a formal um, language. But, um, you know, without diving into deep, uh, deep politics of it, there, the Kurds live all around Turkey. They're not confined to one specific area. Okay, they constitute, the Kurdish language constitutes the majority in southeastern and eastern Turkey, but uh, millions of Kurds live in metropolitan areas of Istanbul, Ankara, Izmir, Adana, Mersin, etc. So they live all around Turkey. So it's, it's there's not so much of a territorial integrity of the of the Kurdish language being confined to only one area. Do you think? It's, but, do you think is uh, that? Um, uh, do you think that uh, about uh, the socio political situation in Turkey uh, over the years uh, tended to uh, deprestige uh, Kurdish uh, as long as long as that Kurdish uh, immigrants within Turkey. Go to big cities and uh, and and try to use Turkish in their everyday life. Speaking speaking only from a linguistic point of view, let, let me let me make a few um, few um, points very clear. First of all, um, Kurdish has many sub dialects in Turkey. There's Kurmanchi, there's Zorani, so um, there's Zaza, which is also um, a right. language uh, close to exactly close to close to Kurdish. So there is not a standard um, that uh, that could be used among the Kurdish community as well. There have been efforts to standardize a language. Uh, you know, for example, the Kurds in Iraq use the Arabic script as opposed to the Kurds in Turkey use the use the Latin script. So it's it's a literature has been emerging uh, for for the Kurdish language, but uh, you know it still takes time to, to develop this. And if you want to study more formal subjects like uh, you know physics and chemistry and mathematics, there is not much. Um, how should I put it? There isn't enough literature uh, written in the Kurdish language to be able to use. In addition to that, okay, you can talk about the restrictions that, that were put on the Kurdish language uh, on, on in the education system because it was not recognized as a as a, as a formal um, formal language uh, to be used for education purposes. That's a whole other topic to be discussed. But from a linguistic point of view, I think what makes it particularly cumbersome for the for the Kurdish language is. There, there are many dialects. Not all of them are, are, are united with a standard orthography, and there is not enough, um, how should I put it, the books written in, in Kurdish so that you can use it for, uh, for all your educational, um, for educational purposes. So in that case, it's very dissimilar to the situation in the Basque country or in Catalonia, where you have really 
um, education systems in parallel, <clears throat> where you can study any 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 topic in 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 Basque or in Catalan for that matter. But um, Tur Turkey is not uh, the, is not in that place at the moment, at least for for the uh, for the Kurdish language. Yes. However, while in um, in Catalonia, uh, it's, it, I will not say that it's somewhat enforced, but Ex there's a chance that uh, within a kind of uh, immersion model, you can uh, you can study uh, all the subjects in Catalan if you want. Uh, you can study all that subject in Spanish except Catalan uh, language and or other subjects in Catalan as well. However, uh, um, the educational model in the Basque country uh, is divided in four, in four main categories, uh, A, B, G, and D, where uh, uh, one of one of the model is entirely in Basque in the cash product. Uh, one uh, other model is mixed with several subjects in uh, Basque and several in Spanish in Escola. Uh, 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 the third model is entirely in Spanish, except the Basque language subject in Basque. And the other uh, model, the, the, the letter G with Castellania, is entirely in Spanish. In in that in that sense, uh, as uh, over over the time, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, families decided to educate their uh, children either in sorry either in G or D. I mean either in only uh, uh, only Spanish education with Basque uh, subject or entirely in Spanish. And in that sense, I observe I I, I watch um uh, uh, there the, the, the watch uh, um, a retrotract uh, of. Uh, um, diminish the language uh, in, in the Basque country and it's mm. and it's a matter of concern. Certainly, certainly. Ciro, I got a, I got a question for you. Um, th this is uh, quite similar to the situation Matthias had des described earlier. You mentioned that um, Swedish is a mandatory subject in Finnish schools, but how about those who have Swedish language as their mother tongue are they competent enough when they finish their formal education? Are they competent enough to to have uh, to to join the Finnish uh, labor market? And uh, do do they speak Finnish well enough, um, just like the native Finns? I think I think it depends on where they live. Um, they and I, I think they also call Finnish the enforced Finnish. Um, <laughs> But, <laughs> um, and I actually, um, all the Swedish, like all the p people I know who have Swedish as their native language in Finland, they speak Finnish fluently. They're just like completely bilingual. Mm -hmm. But I also once, when I was um, tutoring students, international or like um, Nordic students in Iceland, there was this girl from Finland and she didn't really speak Finnish, which was, I, I thought it was interesting um, as a linguist. So maybe like, maybe she was from an area where they only speak Swedish and they see all the Swedish TV channels and everything. Um, really? So that, that was interesting, yeah. So I don't know how the situation is, but all the people I know <laughs> personally that are Swedish uh, speaking Finns, they speak both fluently. And how about the Samis up north? So. If you're that's, from Utsioki or yeah, Inari that's, Sami, like. <laughs> it's it's complicated because um, Sami people don't have um, as many rights as they would like to have, and it also like it's also about politics, like their their lands and everything. Um, but I think you have the right to learn your native language. If it's one of the Samis, you have the right to learn it at school and you have the right to take the uh, magical Asian exam in the Sami, um, which one you sp speak as a native language, but it hasn't mm. always been like that. So it's quite recent. Can, can uh, you study Sami? Like, can you uh, study mathematics, for example, in Sami language or take the geography class in Skolt Sami or Inari or? I think so. I'm actually not sure, um, but I think so. And um, and I don't actually know how the um, like the study material, how, right. how much they have of that. 
So right. sometimes I wouldn't be surprised if they have their the books in in Finnish or Swedish Norwegian, but then they they have mm. the classes in Sami. So that's something Certainly. I we didn't really talk about when I started. I started learning uh, North Sami during the quarantine. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I love having like that such such happy. friends. You know, like what do you do during the quarantine? <laughs> yeah, I, well, I started North Sami and Quechua, so. <laughs> Um, as you do, um, nice. but it's, uh, the situation is not as, as good as it should be. And like, for example, if you live in Turku, like in the South and you want to learn Sami, it's really difficult to be able to do that because there, there, um, you don't have language schools for Sami in the South and right. it, it might be really difficult to find anything online. So right. it's, right. it could be a lot I better. One thing to keep in mind is uh, the Sami language is the, the, the Sami language itself is not confined to Finland. It's also spoken in Norway. It's spoken in Sweden. Uh, to a certain extent, it's also spoken in Russia. Yeah. So um, uh, the, the part of the port in the in the extreme north, the limit the limit with Norway and Russia. Yep. Certainly, certainly. But you know, it, it comes to the it comes down to the economies of scale. Similar to Romansh people, you know, with 50,000 people speak this language uh, broken down by many dialects. I don't know how many dialects Sami has. Uh, there's Skolt Sami. There's, uh, uh, I'm sure there are a few others that I cannot recall right now. So, you know, you have to standardize the language. You have to agree on the orthography. And then you have to start creating content in that language. Well, and, and in, in that sense, uh, I will take advantage to... To, to take um, uh, one the, the last point uh, about uh, the, the the difference between uh, language and dialect somewhat it's not about the linguistic point of view but uh, much rather than a sociology point of view for example the the, the, the so-called dialects of Italy uh, who uh, in the political uh, in sorry in the linguistic point of view are really different languages because the difference between, for example, standard uh, Italian and Neapolitan or Sicilian or Calabrian is like is, uh, is an unintelligible like oh, sorry or so the same uh, status as uh, Spanish, Catalan or um, Italian or French and really literally they are language of the same family rather than dialects but they are dialects from a sociologic point of view well. Uh, in, the, in, the, in that sense, the, edu the education uh, in, in regional languages, uh, in, in, in the sense that uh, Italy, well, Italy, as well as other countries like, uh, for example, Finland itself, Poland, uh, or uh, even Japan, okay, there are some, they have, they have somewhat like diglossia or even triglossia, I mean, the, the standard, the standard, the standard language, an approximation of the standard language, and different local varieties with uh, literally are unintelligible between them. And, and to, to coordinate some kind of uh, education, in, in, it, it somewhat, somewhat uh, it, it, um, I mean, it crashes against the, the local use of the language. Uh, yep. But with such a matter of prestige, in addition to the, the regional languages of, of, of Italy, we have, for example, the situation of um, Calabrian Greek, the, the, the local variety of Greek spoken in Reggio Calabrian Salento in uh, southern Italy, that our fellow member Giuseppe Delfino speaks very well. And she, uh, sorry, Giuseppe Delfino is also a friend of my Olympia Spilacci, who uh, runs a summer school in Reggio Calabria, who teaches Calabrian Greek. Uh, and also, um, for, ex for example, uh, my Greek teacher, my modern Greek teacher, Sabas, uh, is from Leonidio, uh, the only town in, in entire Greece who speaks uh, the local dialect, Sakonika. Sakonika language, as well as the Greek Calabrian dialect, they are only sp sp it's spoken only by 2,000 people in, uh, in the case of Sakonica and 5,000 or maybe 10,000 people and uh, in, in southern Italy. And they both of them run summer schools. Uh, yeah. what, what, what can we do when we have a language that 
uh, as minority language they are, as minority language they are, uh, they are not neither official nor co-official. They are well, not, but they only survive like as a summer school. How can we transmit that, for example, to further generations? Definitely. Definitely. Look, I mean, you, you, you mentioned Sakonika. That's uh, for those uh, who don't know about Sakonika, that's the language of the Spartans. Yes, that is now exactly. spoken only at the very edge of the, um, at the end of the Mora Peninsula in, in, in Greece. So actually, Sakonika, until the population exchange of 1922 between Turkey and Greece, Sakonika was also spoken in Turkey in the region yes. of Bursa, modern day Bursa then Greek population, Turkish populations were exchanged. So uh, we, we, we no longer have those speakers in, in, in Turkey. Um, but I, I think, it, you know, with 2000 people, it's, it, it's we, we have to admit it is a dying language. So we have to preserve as much as we can and, to, and the recordings, oh. you know, uh, books, etc. But it comes down to it, it, it should come down to the efforts of the native speakers. Print, they have some print material, but it's not enough. Two thousand people. I don't know. Two two thousand people. Um, I don't think it's enough to 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 you know keep a language alive. Because you know what keeps a language alive these days. You know you have to. It's not just TV and radio. You know you have to see content on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, social media, you have to listen to music, uh, you know, the, the, the newspapers, etc. This is what keeps languages alive. Okay, if it's a maybe very isolated community, it might be sufficient that you only keep it among yourselves, but in a generation or two, so long as you communicate with the outside world, that language is going to die. Well, you, you know that although we have uh, in, the, in that case, uh, people, uh, sorry, languages with only a bunch of thousand people who can barely speak the language with the, with this generation maybe uh, in the next or following generation maybe cannot survive or maybe not in, in those summer schools they have created specific content uh, in order that uh, the, the children can learn the language however they are they are also um, uh, uh, several cases uh, for example, we have a uh, Hadja, a uh, language with only 1,000 uh, people, but it is uh, spoken in Angola. But, uh, they, but they are vibrant, even though with a radio program. But also we have languages like Latino or Middle Spanish with uh, 150,000 people, but mostly uh, older age and maybe cannot survive the next generation. Carlos Chira Lopez, a uh, fellow member, can uh, say uh, about that. In, in, so in that sense, the, the situation of, uh, of the languages, uh, uh, I mean, the, the status of every language uh, doesn't necessarily belong uh, or match with, with the amount of speakers because it's how, um, how, how uh, strong are the structures which that language, uh, which those languages uh, can, can, can be sustainable? Certainly. Certainly, certainly. I mean, at least um, as a as a patriotic Swiss, I'm doing my best. I'm studying Sursevich at the moment, um, but I, uh, you know, we'll we'll see how fluent I'm going to be once I take the uh, proficiency exam. But um, you know, the, the biggest challenge that I find as a non-native speaker of a of a minority language is you know, finding irrelevant, usable material. There are, you, 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 you have in front of us a Finnish and an Argentinian who both of, both of us can speak Euskera. <laughs> I'm excluded now, I, I'm a Turk in Swiss, I don't speak <laughs> not, Basque language. <laughs> not yet, not yet. <laughs> well, uh, it's about, it's about a uh, matter of will. You know, maybe we should do the next podcast in Euskara, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so for Challenge me, accepted. It's, it's a great, Siru, uh, Ilker, for me, it's a great honor to be here uh, among you guys. And I hope that in the next chapter of the Hippia podcast, can be, uh, can, can we touch uh, different, uh, several topics about languages and linguistics. 
And for me, it's a greatest honor because I consider you guys my, my personal friends. And I love you guys. And uh, I, I hope to, to see you again. <laughs>